All right. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I am very happy to have you here. I'm uh, Dr. Bill Honigman. I'm a retired emergency room physician from Orange County, California. And this is the PDA Healthcare Emergency Online Town Hall for Sunday, May 24th, 2020. This is uh, the 17th uh, session that we've done in the series, which began back in March when, when most of us ordered to stay at home for our collective good due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And due to this healthcare emergency and the climate emergency, we know we'll be bringing even more pandemics and other new and deadly healthcare problems on our way. We at Progressive Democrats, America, the people demanding action, decided to step up the discussion and our advocacy for healthcare justice and healthcare as a human right by going from a monthly national meeting to twice a week at first. Uh, we're now down to once a week as we're getting closer to assuming normal and social activities, uh, although most of us are still in our homes. Uh, but for now, we're going to have these uh, every Sunday uh, online and uh, for the time being until we can, you know, again, start meeting in, in person. And then at that point, we'll probably go to once a month online. Um, so uh, we on the PDA Healthcare Issue Team have recognized, uh, we recognized early on that to have a decent response to the pandemic at the very least, what we need is a Medicare for All system of universal health care, like so many other countries around the world have. And they're showing much, much better outcomes in dealing with COVID-19 as a result. Not a surprise to any of us. Uh, we know that Medicare for All will save money and save lives, and even more so in times of the pandemic where inadequate allocation of resources due to a market-based approach to our health equals more preventable deaths, and where economic downturns caused by quarantine conditions are buffered, where the savings of a single-payer system will mean more money in the budgets for states, cities, counties, even school and water districts when finally implemented. So in these healthcare emergency town halls, We've had a number of great speakers already, including especially Medicare for All uh, scholars, local leaders, candidates, and other advocates in the movement. With great discussions that have followed their presentations and vibrant discussions from national PDA organizers and staff on recommended actions that we can take. So in our in in our activism in this regard. So today we, we have another lineup of impressive candidates and local leaders on this issue, uh, including Betsy Sweet, who's running for U.S. Senate from Maine, Jim Harper, who's running for U.S. House from Indiana, and Brenda Siegel, who's running for Lieutenant Governor of the state of Vermont. But before we get to them, I first want to thank the PDA staff who've helped considerably with production and, and promotion of these town halls including Alan Minsky, Executive Director of PD America, Andrew Miller, Executive Director of PD Action, uh, Mike Hirsch, who's Communications Director for PDA and helping me um, manage the, uh, the uh, Zoom meeting room, and Mike Fox, Deputy Executive Director of PDA and National uh, um, Field Staff Leader, who will give us a, a bit of a preview for the things we can do um, that, uh, that'll be our wrap up uh, at the end, but we'll bring them out at first for a bit of a preview. Uh, before that, a word or two on meeting protocol, please feel free to post comments, questions, and links in the chat, and use participants raise hand, or physically raise your hand if you're on video, to be placed in a stack for questions for each speaker or to make comments. Uh, please limit the time of your question or comments so our speakers will have time to respond. And finally, please use uh, online video etiquette of, of keeping your audio muted if you're not speaking and stop your video if you're moving around or doing anything you wouldn't want all of us to see. So with that, let me bring the unstoppable Mike Fox from St. 
Petersburg, Florida, up for a preview on PA actions for the week, and then we'll go to our speaker. Mike Fox, are you there? Indeed I am, Dr. Bill, and thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for being on the call. And a reminder, I, I'm not sure how we're getting it, but we're getting somebody typing. So if you're typing, uh, please do mute your, uh, mute your audio. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, these calls always bring a minimum of three things to us. Uh, the first thing it brings to us is some really great information from some really sharp people who know this issue inside and out. So the number one thing you're going to get out of this call is you're going to get information that conceivably you did not know before and you're going to learn about ways to get active on the back end. Number two, uh, we build community in this process been kind of tough as we've been all isolated. It's absolutely wonderful to be in a space where uh, we're hanging out with folks who get it. I know it inspires me every Sunday and I hope you get that same inspiration. And number three, and arguably the most important thing is we do. And the doing in this, uh, in this call uh, consists of making either contributions uh, via monetary means or uh, via sweat equity. Um, so our, we have a goal on this call on Sundays of five new donations and five new folks standing up on the projects that I will mention on the back end, primarily uh, using uh, a telephone from home. However, we have a couple other things that you can do that don't involve telephones necessarily. So our goal is going to be number one, to learn Learn stuff. Number two, absolutely love the community that we are building here. And number three, find five new donors and five new workers. And that is all. Take it away, Dr. Bill. Okay, thanks so much, Mike Fox. <clears throat> that is Mike Fox at pdamerica.org. Um, message him for anything and everything that's PDA. So thank you, Mike Fox. Uh, so our first guest is candidate for U.S. Senate from Maine, Betsy Sweet. Uh, Betsy, I know you, you already have a lot of fans in PDA because of your position on Medicare for All as well as other policies, and you've already done some uh, previous meetings and appearances with us. So we're wondering especially what's your outlook on COVID-19 and the fight for healthcare justice, and how can we help you in your race for Senate? All right. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's so great to be here with you. And I hope you're all having a good weekend. And it's some it's difficult, I think, during some of this quarantining to know what's the weekend and what's the regular day. And, and for those of us who are campaigning, it's seven days a week anyway. So um, someone said, Oh, it's a long weekend. I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't really make a difference. But it is Memorial Day weekend. And, and I think it's a chance for us to really think about our priorities, and um, really about what keeps us secure. And, um, you know, back in the day, uh, I think security was really uh, measured in megatons and bombing abilities and warship abilities, as opposed to keeping us really safe. And we see now with this pandemic that um, uh, public health threat is one of the biggest threats to our national security. And we were and are woefully unprepared for such a security threat. And so um, I think this is, uh, in, in a way, if it's possible, I hate to even say it, but it's a silver lining, um, and especially as we fight for Medicare for all and medical coverage for every American. And, you know, I, I might have said this on my, the other PDA meeting, but it's so striking to me, you know, to me, tying healthcare to employment was never a good idea. But now we have 38 million Americans, and in Maine, we have 60,000 people who have lost their jobs, who now know it's not a good idea. They, because not only have they lost their jobs, and as their world's upended, but they have lost their health care as well. At a time when they are afraid, whether they do or not, they're very fearful that they're going to need medical care. And, right, and the idea that choice to go to a doctor or to a hospital or to get help or call an ambulance could mean the difference between life and death, but it could also mean the difference between financial ruin and financial stability. And so it, it, we are in this horrible position. We put people in this horrible position. Um, and I think that's terrible and i think but the positive side the the silver lining is that a window is now open we now have 37 million more allies for medicare for all than we had two months ago because the folk people understand i think when people live it 
you know, people understand it better and they're willing to fight harder for it. And, you know, we wish that wasn't true, but, and it, you know, it's true. I've been talking to workers as well. And, you know, I would like everyone to want to have healthcare for all for everybody because we love each other and we care about each other. And, you know, that's awesome. But now even the most, the people who don't care about each other now, if you don't have healthcare coverage and you don't go to a doctor and you don't have paid sick leave and you come to work because you don't have any other choice, either because of your employer requiring you to come or you can't afford not to stay home or afford to stay home, you're going to get me sick and then I'm going to go get my family sick. And so it, it, even if even the most selfish person, even the person who doesn't care at all about fellow humanity, I think is going to be on our side now because of the way that we see how it's impacting us every single one of us. And so um, I think that, you know, again, I think the challenge for us, and I'm so happy to be here with all of you and other candidates as well, um, you know, the challenge is to elect leaders who are going to use this opportunity to bring permanent policy changes. You know, we can't just go back to normal, you know. Normal was really broken. Normal wasn't working for the vast majority of Americans. And so this idea, I hear my opponent, Susan Collins, saying all the time, Oh, then we'll go back to normal. I can't wait till we go back to normal. And, you know, we don't want to go back to normal. You know, we want to, we want to not only reopen America, we want to reimagine America. And I think the foundation for reimagining America, besides economic justice, is healthcare. And that is the foundation for economic justice. So, um, so neither my opponent in the primary nor my opponent in the general election uh, support Medicare for all in Maine. And so it is really becoming a deciding factor for us. And so we are very excited about the number of people who are coming on board and who are really, really saying that this is the issue. And if we needed, it was like if the universe wanted to give us a way to care, to all of a sudden get a, a jump start on this or get a jolt of energy about Medicare for all, this is it. And isn't it ironic, right, that the, that the issues that PDA and all of you and I have been working on for so many years are the very policies that are getting us through this epidemic and are the ones that are being talked about to get us through out of this economic collapse. You know, so I think that, again, we have a, an incredible opportunity if we hold on to it and we move forward. And I think if we elect same old, same old, whether they're Republican, same old, same old, or Democratic, same old, same old, we are going to get, we are going to go back to a normal that was very, very broken. And I don't, I don't think we're there. I think we are ready for this transition. And I think millions of Americans are. I was talking to some folks the other day and I said, you know, the divide in America, in my view, is not right or left. It's not conservative or liberal. It's really up or down. It's really... Who are the people? There's an elite. There's an economic elite, and those are the millionaires and the billionaires. There's a political elite that is benefiting very much from the system staying the way it is, and they don't want much change. They want a little nibbling around the edges, but they don't want big change. And then there's the rest of us who are trying to make it in this economic system that doesn't work for us, in a political system that doesn't represent what we want or what we care about or what we're trying to get done, or understand what we're going through every day, you know, what we go through as parents, as grandparents, as children, as people trying to educate, as people trying to care for one another. You know, it just seems like they're, they're completely missing it. And in Maine, and I'm sure this is true around the country, one of the things that was so clear about this up or down divide was the unemployment um, packages. Right? And so, yes, it's great that they gave a $600 bump. But if you're self-employed, and we have a lot of self-employed people in Maine, you had to wait. You're still, maybe people are still waiting two, three months to get any, any help at all under this notion that somehow self-employed people somewhere have three months of living expenses tucked away somewhere. That's not accurate. That's not accurate for any of the self-employed people that I know. But I think when we elect people who don't have that lived experience and don't have that understanding, then they just, you know, they've never had to not be able to make ends meet at the end of a month. And so they don't think about it that much. And they thought they were doing a great thing. And we know it ran out and it wasn't a great thing and all that stuff, but, and then it helped mostly big corporations. But even so, this idea that, you know, we'll just take time for the bureaucracy to catch up. Well, people have to eat in the meantime. And so I'll just end with, I, I again, I really think we have this incredible opportunity. And I think we have an opportunity, again, to re-envision and reimagine America, but also to reimagine how we relate to one another and how we care for one another. Because, you know, I was speaking to a woman who was going to the food bank for the first time in her life. And she was horrified. 
She was horrified that that's where she had come to through no fault of her own. You know, and I think we've done so much shaming of people who are on the receiving end of assistance in this country, so much shaming. And so now here we have 40 million people almost who are out of work through absolutely no fault of their own and understanding that it's a systems problem, that the system is broken, that our economy is fragile, that we have got to rebuild literally from the grassroots up and that we have to rebuild our foundation. And that includes paying workers fairly, it includes everyone having health care, and it includes defining national security as being able to deal with the pandemic because unfortunately this may be feel like a first one that's not our last one and I, we know that so i think we have an incredible opportunity in maine we, our campaign we're you know as i said people are coming um fast and furious which is awesome and um we have to have leaders that will take this and move us forward so let me stop there i'm happy to answer any questions or if there's anything else you want me to talk about i'm happy to do that but i am so grateful for pda the work that you do every day what you do all the time for me and other people, it is what's gonna change America. And I think people are ready for that change. Well, thank you. Thank you, Betsy, uh, so much. Thanks for running for office. Thanks for joining us, of course. Uh, thanks for speaking up on behalf of, um, of healthcare justice. And it seems, it, you know, to me, it, it's so refreshing because it seems there's, there's an absolute lack, a dearth of, of you know, really, um, uh, uh, courageous enough politicians to, to stand up and, and and see the emperor has no clothes when it comes to health care. So I appreciate that, that you're one of the champions. Um, with that, if uh, folks have questions for Betsy, we have a few minutes uh, before we have to bring on our next uh, candidate. So um, uh, anyone with a question, please click on participants and the raise hand function. I don't see any hands raised there. Well, somebody but, did make a comment, um, Dr. Bill, I wanna say sure. about, you know, that some of us are still waiting for stimulus checks. Absolutely, I'm still waiting for mine. And I am the person that I was talking about. You know, I'm a, I have two of my own businesses. They've all, you know, they're all way down. Um, I still haven't gotten a stimulus check, um, you know, so I think there are lots of people, you know, we, and we don't have the means to like go on and on and on with no savings, with no help. And so we're really, um, and I think, you know, again, it's wonderful that we help each other. You know, I'm sure you saw one of my favorite things in the last uh, couple of weeks was when AOC, remember when um, Bill Gates said he was really trying to get billionaires to give more to help in COVID. And, and, and AOC said, I think we have a system for that. It's called um, paying your taxes. And that's how we actually help people. So maybe you could get more of your billionaire friends to pay. The system is all set up. It's ready to go. Just pay your fair share and we'll all be fine. <laughs> so um, it's really, uh, it's, yeah. So anyway, so I think, exactly. you know, I think we have to, we have to, we have to define where the divide is in America and it's not between right and left and it's not between conservatives and liberals or neighbors and neighbors. It's really between the elite up and down. And I think when we define it that way, people say, that's right. That's why. I, that's why things aren't going well. So, um, you know, that's absolutely true. And it's it's those members of society who have been uh, neglected, underserved, uh, you know, who are suffering most. So, uh, so absolutely, thank you for bringing that forward. Is there anyone else um, who has a question or or a comment along those lines? Feel free again. Use the raise hand function. Um, from your participants tab or just raise your hand on your video. Well, um, and there is somebody who said something that I didn't talk about, which is usually my favorite thing to talk about. So, and that is the reason we don't have healthcare in this country. And that is because of money and politics. I mean, we're the yeah. only country in the world that doesn't have it because the money from insurance companies and pharmaceuticals who have a gazillion dollar interest in keeping things the way they are, are lining the pockets of our politicians. And they are lining the pockets of the politicians in my race, both my primary opponent and my, um, my general opponent, although my primary opponent's trying to hide it more, you know, because they do the, you know, they do the loophole thing when that's fine, um, or that's what they do. But, that is what they you, know, do. I think as, you know, as long as that, I mean, that's who has access. That's yep. who talks about what's going to happen. That They're also the same people funding the fear campaigns about, to everybody about, oh, you're going to lose your health care. Oh, you know, so, but it looks yeah. like David has a question. Well, uh, hang on a second. I think I saw Shahrazad. Oh, sorry, so. okay. 
Great. Sorry. Uh, from Southern California, Shahrazad. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So, uh, thank you for uh, being with us, Betty, Betsy. I'm wondering what you said, Maine, and I'm sorry, I don't know. Who are your opponents, primary opponents now? Oh, great. So, there's, um, there's a three way primary in Maine. There is me and then a uh, woman, Bree Kidman, who is um, the first non binary person to run for federal office and is running. Um, Awesome. They're an awesome person, and they are not running with any fundraising at all. They're really running to open a pathway. Um, and then the other person is Sarah Gideon, who is the um, DSCC anointed candidate. Um, so, but the great thing in Maine is we have ranked choice voting. And if you have a chance to vote for ranked choice voting, it is the thing that allows us to win this race. Um, so people can vote for Bree, and then if if Bree doesn't win, then it comes to me, or they can vote for me because it's their heart, and then they and then they can you know say, well, this I really want change, but what if she doesn't win, or what if she can't win, and then they and then they can put number two as Sarah Gideon or somebody else, and so it really gives us an opening that many other uh, progressives in other states don't have. Um, so, yes, thank you, and and for those for folks who don't know, Betsy Sweet is a champion of fair elections, to fair and clean elections. Uh, in yeah. the state of Maine. So thank you so much for that too. You said there was a, a David, I don't, I don't see him in the queue, but was yeah. there David with a David question? David Greenstein looks like. Did you, David, did you have a question or comment? I see you've been posting in the chat, which is great. Uh, let me see if we can unmute your, your line. You got that? Uh, Okay, it should be working now. We have to make it blatantly clear to everybody in the country that any member of Congress who does not support Medicare for all must be assumed to have been bribed by insurance companies unless proven otherwise. If everybody yeah. knew that, they would be shamed into uh, passing the bills right now. Not until, not after the election, but right now. In fact, if we put that, that, that that, uh, that campaign in, Bernie would be elected. Bernie would be the one that's offering that, and and Biden and Trump won't, will not offer it. So if yeah. Bernie were offering, if Bernie were, were available, say in the Green Party, he would be offering it, and he would win. We have to yes. draft him back into the into the campaign, into the say the Green Party, where they they can enter him into every into every state. And if All right. Well, thanks, David. Sorry, I gotta I gotta cut you off because we we've got more candidates. So, so sorry about that, but you're absolutely right. No disagreement here, right, Betsy? Betsy right. is one of these champions who you know is is uh, coming out and speaking the truth on this. So uh, not in the pockets of uh, of a big insurance and big farmer. So thank you, Betsy. Closing comment? No, I just want to say thank you all and. Um, Please, for me and other people, if you can help us financially, if, or if you can help doing calls, we're doing calling. We're making uh, 50,000 calls a week uh, to people to persuade and ID, and it's awesome. Um, and it's how we're gonna win. So if you can help us out, you can do it from anywhere. It's a really easy program on your computer. And um, we'll let us, let us know through Mike or through BetsySuite.com, um, and we will get you hooked up. But we, I think we have an opportunity and I think, I think we are gonna turn this around and really reimagine our country. So thank you for all that you do to help us do that. And um, I, I am grateful for the time to speak with you. All right, well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And um, we're all gonna be uh, clicking on these links in the chat to, to uh, support you as much as we can and, and following your race. So um, thank you and keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, so I don't see our next guest here. Um, Mike Hirsch is uh, Jim Harper from Indiana. Is he not in the house? <laughs> I will, Mike? I will, I'll ping him, Dr. Bell, if you want to continue. Okay. Um, is Brenda here? I saw her earlier. Brenda Siegel from Vermont. And Jacob, are we back? Because Brenda was due up third, so she might not be available right now. 
Brenda's here. It looks like she's having trouble unmuting. Okay. Let's see if we can help with that. How about now? Thank you. For some reason, my computer has a new thing where I can't unmute myself. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and sorry about that with your, your computer's new thing. So for those who don't know, um, uh, Brenda Siegel, uh, you already have a big fan in this group. Uh, Alan Minsky, our executive director of PD America, knows you well. And so if folks have kind of, you know, outside, uh, want some more outside information on, on Brenda, uh, you can reach uh, Alan, of course, anyone on staff uh, for PDA, uh, Alan, A-L-1-L-A-N, right, Alan? Alan at uh, pdamerica.org. So, but uh, thanks for stepping up right now. Apparently, Jim Harper's not come on for some reason so far. We're trying to reach him. Uh, Brenda Siegel is a candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Vermont. And Brenda, uh, I'm sure we all would especially like to hear what you think about Vermont's uh, recent attempt at having, us, having their own single payer system. We have a very well educated and involved group right here. We've all been working on single payer throughout the country, um, both at the state and the federal level. So um, how would your bellwether state, uh, who we all hold in great reverence, um, how, would, uh, how would you then, as the lieutenant governor, be able to go the next step for Vermont to get their own single payer system? And what do you think in, in terms of COVID-19 uh, bringing out this issue uh, for you? Has it, has it come out in the campaign? Or um, what do you see now as the you know, challenges and opportunities due to the pandemic? Um, that's what I would like to know. Really. <laughs> so thank you for being with us, Brenda, and for writing too. Thank you so much for having me. And I really love PDA, and I've watched all of you operate um, since a long time ago when you first uh, were supportive of my senator, Bernie Sanders, uh, who I interned for in my 20s in DC, uh, and uh, who I have just incredible, not just admiration for, but the way that he speaks for people like me. I'm a low-income single mom. Uh, so I really um, just appreciate being here. And I'm actually going to start by telling you a story that I don't talk about on the campaign trail very often. Um, I want to tell you the story of an athletic 34-year-old woman who was an activist, a choreographer, a dancer, a, cycle, a dance educator, a cyclist, a runner. She ran five miles nearly every day and frequently biked centuries. And then one day in December of 2010, she went to the gym to run five miles. And two days later, she returned and could not make it a mile. Mm. And within a month, she had trouble eating and was holding on to walls to walk. That woman is me. I am the only parent of my now 18 year old. And when he was eight years old, who I am as a mom to him changed forever. Overnight, just as is happening in COVID-19 right now, our lives changed in a really difficult way. So I really wanna make clear that this is not new for so many people across this country and across Vermont. Uh, because I had incredible health insurance, because my family had supported me in having health insurance, I, after many months of testing and several journeys to the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, uh, a Vermont doctor who cared a lot, uh, I got my life back. I take medication though every single time I put food in my mouth. Any amount of food and because of that, I am perfectly healthy. Although COVID is a scary option for me. Uh, but to stay that way, my medication alone would cost in the neighborhood of $18,000 a year if I did not have the health, good health insurance. And in Vermont, you can have Medicaid backup. So if I did not have private health insurance with Medicaid backup, I would, I would lose the ability to be well. And that does not include the tens of thousands of doctor's visits uh, and emergency room visits and testing that I had for many years. I wanna just add that before I was sick, I never went to the doctor and I was fine, I was healthy and I believed in my heart, there was no way I would ever get sick. So while we're all really well versed in it, I really want to paint that picture that I was not so I knew I needed health insurance. I'm really grateful that my family had taught me that, but I didn't, I didn't know that I would get sick. And that's something that Americans and Vermonters experience all the time. 
COVID has highlighted it for us, but it has not changed it for so many people. Uh, there's not always indicators that your life is going to change overnight. It's just, there just aren't. And so oftentimes I'll be like, not now, but oftentimes I'll be standing in the bank and I'll hear people feel excited about there no longer being a penalty for those who don't have health insurance and thank, and thank God because that penalty was killing me. And I think, gosh, I really hope you don't suddenly get sick. I really hope that uh, we just don't know. I, and I feel compelled to almost say it to them. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I say, well, I, I got sick overnight. I didn't know I was going to get sick. And how many of us do I, we know who suddenly died of a heart attack? or suddenly got cancer. Uh, and I think we know that I believe my it's our responsibility to lift everyone up. And if there's some way you can help, you should. So I've been a huge part of this fight for Act 48, which is the single payer system that's currently on the books in Vermont, but not funded. Uh, I don't buy into the, uh, and, and most Vermonters I would say, even though Legislature, legislators do not actually buy into the fact that healthcare is a privilege, but there's a big fear piece, and we'll get to that in just a second, about funding Act 48. So when we're facing such, um, such attacks on healthcare and in nationally, for us not to fix the problem on a state level, I think is also irresponsible, or within like a, a coalition of states is also another way that Vermonters are looking at right now. So I just think that when we go local to my state of Vermont, I can't, I just can't stop thinking about Act 48. And I've gone to many rallies and, and spoken out at many press conferences about this issue. Uh, when we already have this single payer system on the books, we're not funding it. Um, I know a 15 year old who died of cancer, who, I, who was very close to me, uh, Lexi Giolella. And she, as she laid on her deathbed, her mom received a bill that showed her total had due had reached a million dollars. And that's here in Vermont, single payer was already on the books and she could have been spared that cost. So I wanna go into the weeds a little bit on that issue. Uh, just over 60% of Vermonters are funded with some kind of subsidy. And so we're actually only talking about about 30% of Vermonters that would need to be cut it, covered in, that, in this circumstance. And in my opinion, while we're on our way to Medicare for all, because I will fall on the sword that, uh, that fights for Medicare for all, and I believe we will get it eventually. I think the tide has turned. So uh, some of these people that are subsidized do, ha uh, do have su some payment that they have to make, uh, but we are, there is 60% just over the about that are subsidized and the others might have private insurance might not be insured at all might have uh and and but medicaid is falling in the 60 percent and we have a high amount of medicaid here and and good medicaid um Brenda, uh, Brenda, sorry to interrupt but uh, i did want to uh, see if you could specifically tell us what happened with your former governor and the effort to get Medicaid, you know, to get a single payer system for Vermont, and right. how would you, as the lieutenant governor, be able to, you know, step up to that? Challenge? So that's that's what I'm getting to, but it's it, with the the framing of it being 60 percent or then 30 percent is really important because I'm a, my next sentence was going to be that uh, that in order to have a Medicare for all system or the single payer system, our taxes would fluctuate from 11 percent to 17 percent every year, and it, it's not consistent. So, um, but, but when you frame it that 60% of us are already receiving some kind of subsidy and we are paying taxes for this already, then that also makes a, a bit of a difference. And that scared people and um, we lost the political will. So I also don't think that, um, that our former governor was necessarily totally committed to it. Um, there was, I was involved in many protests around it uh, and, he he did fight for it hard, but as soon as that tax change went, um, he just backed off almost immediately. It was it was very hard, and I will tell you that his next election, um, he won barely. He won by uh, like one percent. So it did it did follow him. This and, this. and the next step, right? From from so, your point of view, is. So then we have, in, in, as Lieutenant Governor of Vermont, how Lieutenant Governor works in Vermont, you don't do, you can't do a lot, right? So, um, so what you can do is advocate and what you can do is build a movement on the ground. So uh, the, I think that what you really have to do is build that movement on the ground. And we need someone at, at 
there that is able to do that kind of uh, movement building. And I think that there's, um, there are several organizations, one of them is Rights and Democracy, who is coming up with a new system for um, Act 48. So kind of let's scrap what was there for Act 48 and let's fight for the whole deal again, but remove some of those things that we compromised away to get Act 48. And so we can act, so, so we need to be working with the organizations that are working on this issue um, mm -hmm. and be working on the ground to push forward the stories of the most marginalized voices um, and to bring them, not just invite them, but to bring them into leadership roles in order to actually make those changes. Perfect. So I think Thank that you. that's essential. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to bring up kind of for the first question or, or comment, commenter, commentator. Um, your good friend, Alan Minsky, the mm -hmm. executive director of, of PDA. Alan, uh, um, is your, are you unmuted? I believe I am. Can you hear me, Dr. Bill? Yes. Um, hi, can. Brenda. How are you doing? Okay. Great to see you, you, Brenda. Yeah, I apologize for not being on screen. I'm actually on a handheld uh, walking around my yard right now. But um, hi, everybody. And um, I just wanted to chime in. Uh, first of all, it's so great to be on the call with Betsy Sweet. It'd be brilliant to have Betsy in the U.S. Senate. I think uh, everybody on the call knows, uh, uh, you know, we need really solid progressives uh, inside that legislative body, and she'd be a brilliant addition. The next guest, Jim Harper, we had a call with him the other day. He is fantastic, so everybody's in for a treat to meet another a great um, uh, progressive from Indiana's first district who has a real chance of winning his primary. And I just want to say as quick as I can, I really think Brenda Siegel is um, – herself um, running for lieutenant governor of Vermont, but really one of um, the most important and visionary um, young political uh, candidates that I've run into in the entire country um, in years, and in particular over these 18 months working for PDA. Brenda um, is a, a great champion of two things that I think PDA really needs to get uh, directly involved in. One is that Brenda is a is just an, is an unrelenting proponent of having working class people and people from who are um, you know ec even economically distressed running for uh, office and this doesn't happen enough. Uh, the entire bottom 75 percent of the population is dramatically underrepresented in elected office and Brenda is a great champion for that. And then also Brenda is really one of the leading voices. Um, that I know of in the country uh, from her platform in Vermont uh, addressing what really needs to happen around the opioid epidemic. And um, that's all I'll say because I know I've got to be brief, but um, check out her work on that. I think she advocates, um, you know, does what politicians need to do, go out, look at the world, see where there's the best public policy producing the best results. She studies it and, and brings proposals uh, into Vermont and, and from Vermont they can spread across the country because that is a ongoing tragedy that really is not being focused on enough and there's certainly are not um, there are very few uh, decent responses to that epidemic in the United States so Brenda Siegel you're the greatest okay well there you go high praise yeah <laughs> indeed yeah. Um, so let me uh, I see David Cohen dr. David Cohen formerly uh, East Coaster now lives in uh, Southern California Orange County so the rest of us David you had a question uh, let's unmute your your line. Are we both doing that, Mike Hirsch? <laughs> you got it. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. It, it, it's not it's not necessarily a question, and I'm a, I'm a newbie here. Okay, uh, and I, and I, and okay. I'm a, I, good thank good you. Good to have you with us. And I am a proponent of Medicare for all, but I'm also a proponent of getting our current administration out of office. But I think you know there is. I, I, I guess I have a, a couple of questions. No, I, I do not think there should be a third party with, with, with Bernie Sanders because the third party would just keep our current administration in office right now. But I, I do think that the platform, the Democratic platform that they have in the primary, we're going to have, it's going to have a lot of Bernie's planks in it as a result of this pandemic. And a question I have for everybody is, because, and, and I have a, a very personal interest. I, back east, I know eight people who've come down with it. Uh, four of my relatives, I know four people who've died. Uh, just recently, a very close friend of mine. And I, w I would like to know what the medical bills are for the people, for the survivors, and even those who are deceased to their family, what the medical bills are, do they have to pay 
And I'd like to see that promulgated because I think that if, if there is a situation where somebody comes out of the hospital and their provider provides 70% and they're stuck with an $80,000 bill, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful advertisement for Medicare for All. And I think that should be put out. Thank you. Somebody has yes. to do the research. Thank you so much, David. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, I, I I can, go back to Brenda. If, yeah. if you have a response to that and then to help close out your segment here. Um, yeah, thanks, um, I think it is actually state by state the how that's working. Um, so uh, in Vermont, parts of it are covered 100%, but some of it is not covered. And you can get treatment no matter what, but you still might have to pay the bill. And it's not very clear. People don't know if, but you can get testing for free. So it, uh, it is different in each state is what, what I'm finding. Um, also, uh, I just, yes, to close us out, uh, please do sign up to volunteer. We need to make 167,000 calls, I believe, in the next three weeks to, do, uh, to get through our first round. Voting is starting almost two months earlier because of COVID uh, in Vermont. And so we have to get, the, we have to grab our votes. And also as a low-income person, access to money is a real struggle for me. And so if anyone can donate, please do. Uh, and if you're able to stretch yourself a little, we ask that you will. Thank you so much. And thank you all for having me so much. Uh, and I'm sorry I couldn't get more into the weeds, but it's very technical. If you get into the weeds about why that didn't happen, and I would be here all day. <laughs> so, well, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a real challenge. But thank you so much, Brenda. Thanks uh, to your campaign manager, Jacob, for helping uh, set this up as well. And I know you're really working it. Uh, uh, I first was exposed to you in a, in a South Orange County PDA chapter meeting. So, uh, so it's awesome. Wonderful to see you out there. I would, by the way, be happy to help you if I can uh, on anything healthcare related. But it, especially the opioid uh, overdose and, and addiction issue. Uh, so that's near and dear to my heart as well. Um, so thank you, Brenda. I would like to bring up Jim Harper from Indiana. Jim, are you are you here with us? I think you are. I am, here. Dr. Bill. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, our, our next guest is Jim Harper. He's running for U.S. House, uh, House of Representatives from Indiana. So Jim, um, maybe you could tell us what we need to know about your policy positions on healthcare, Medicare for all, and how COVID-19 should be shaping the agenda for, uh, for us all and, uh, and will when you're in the House of Representatives. Jim, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, and I'm sorry for, for being a little bit late on the call. I apologize for that, but I appreciate you giving me a few minutes here. So um, yeah, my name's Jim Harper. Um, a Democratic candidate for Congress in Indiana's first district, just to kind of give people a brief idea of kind of what we're talking about here or where that is and about the race before diving into health care issues. Um, that's, it's an open Democratic seat. It's one of our two bluer seats here in Indiana. Um, in Northwest Indiana, it's up by um, near Chicago, up by Lake Michigan, um, the, the south shore of Lake Michigan, basically. Um, and uh, kind of the Gary, Indiana area might be the city that people have heard about. We've got our primary uh, coming up here uh, in about 10 days, um, which is gonna be really decisive on who the next representative um, is for this, uh, this, this blue seat. Um, obviously, you know, we've been um, you know, advocating for running on Medicare for All throughout this campaign. Um, the current representative in this district is a gentleman named uh, uh, Pete Visklaski. Um, is uh, more moderate, but is also a uh, co-sponsor of Representative Jayapal's Medicare for All bill. And we want to make sure that we do not lose a co-sponsor of Medicare for All um, from this district. And certainly, um, if our campaign is successful, we will not uh, lose a co-sponsor of Medicare for All in this district. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of the other candidates that are um, uh, you know, running strong in this race as well, um, uh, do not support Medicare for all. So I think it's uh, an important, uh, a reason that we, we believe that this campaign is very important. But we've been, um, you know, running on it th throughout this campaign because of the importance that everybody, you know, here knows about nationally. But I think that there are some really unique concerns that we have in Northwest Indiana. Um, it's a very um, uh, industrial um, uh, region. Um, we have a lot of public health problems um, that, that are exacerbated here because of our, you know, our, our heavy industry and, and um, some of the inequalities that we, that we experience in this region um, that make uh, Medicare for all, of course, all the more important. So Northwest Indiana, for instance, um, has some of the highest uh, infant mortality rates in the country. 
Um, we have um, infant, in some of our cities, infant, infant mortality rates that rival um, uh, Central American countries. Um, we have uh, some of the highest asthma rates and some of the highest cancer rates um, in the country, again, because we are right next to or in the middle of um, some very heavy polluting industries. And obviously, um, that's long been an issue, but under this administration, of course, um, it's gotten even worse. Not surprisingly, um, those industries and those higher rates of infant mortality, asthma and cancer, um, tend to be located in black and brown communities, uh, uh, tend to be located in poorer communities. Um, so there's real big um, environmental justice issues uh, that we have to deal with um, as well. And of course, you know, we have, you know, a significant portion of underinsured or uninsured um, Hoosiers uh, in this district as, as we have around the country. That's always been a problem. Um, we've had, we've had, always had problems with public health outcomes uh, because of that, particularly disparities in public health, health outcomes um, uh, between uh, various different communities in the district. But that's been on full display during COVID. And, and I'm sure, you know, either you all talked about this before I got on or people are well aware of the racial disparities, um, you know, um, that we've seen in uh, health outcomes because of COVID. Um, in our part of the world, in the south side of Chicago, um, that was on full display um, in the um, kind of the racial breakdown of COVID deaths in Chicago. Uh, very stark display there. Um, but we've seen that here in Northwest Indiana too, where the um, epicenter of our uh, COVID outbreak and particularly COVID deaths has been in um, Gary, which is a, a city with a very um, high black population. So we've seen a real you know, racial disparity there. I can tell you, I think that, you know, of course, and again, not saying anything anybody on this call doesn't know, um, shows how, how broken a, um, a healthcare system uh, that is based on employer provided healthcare is, shows the importance of a single payer Medicare for all system, um, and we're continuing to advocate for it um, because, again, COVID has exposed the inequalities in our society um, and exposed the need for a comprehensive solution. The one piece that I think I can add, you know, that might be relevant, I'm not there, you know, not telling anybody here anything they don't know, but one thing I might be able to add is um, that I've seen a real change in the conversations that I've been having just with voters that I've talked to around Northwest Indiana um, on this issue. Um, not to say that there was skepticism beforehand, but I would say, you know, for a lot of voters, uh, they, they didn't, you know, as long as we lowered our, you know, uh, cover, um, uh, un uninsured rates, you know, they were going to be satisfied with that. They just wanted to get there. But I've seen now during this crisis, um, people really recognizing how broken the current healthcare system is, and not only open, but excited about um, a comprehensive, uh, you know, single payer Medicare for all um, system, even amongst people who have very good healthcare right now. I mean, we've got high rates of union, unionization um, in this district, and, and, you know, many of those union members have uh, pretty good healthcare plans right now. Um, even in my conversations with them, I, I have just seen um, the tone change, I have seen the conversation change over the last several weeks. So I would say, you know, it really highlights, you know, the importance of us to be, you know, to, to be focusing on this issue, um, to be fighting for people, certainly in, in the House, in the Senate, and other down ballot races, you know, in our state races, um, as we were just talking about, who are going to be, um, you know, really putting it at the forefront of their agenda, because I think uh, that there is an opportunity that we have right now and, um, you know, that's something I've seen anecdotally, but I'm sure that that's something that's bearing out in other places as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, uh, so much. I, I really appreciate it. I know that a lot of us are working in regions that have those kind of uh, uh, toxic uh, healthcare uh, exposures, and a lot of those communities are lower income communities of color. So you're absolutely right. Um, that, that's what's needed also as Global temperatures rise, of course, we're going to see more of that, um, but it especially hits those communities first. So there's no doubt about it. That is healthcare injustice, and healthcare injustice anywhere is a threat to healthcare injustice uh, everywhere, or, or it will be <laughs> uh, a threat to healthcare injustice everywhere. So, um, so anyhow, um, thank you so much, Jim, and uh, great to hear you and get familiar with you and your campaign. Uh, thanks for running as well. Any questions, uh, comments related to to Jim's campaign or what he was just talking about? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, got one now. Got Ernie, Ernie Powell, uh, Ernie from. Ernie from Los Angeles. Right, LA. Yep. Go ahead, Ernie. Congratulations. 
question for Jim. First of all, congratulations on your candidacy. It sounds Thank very you. exciting. And the same to Brenda as well. Um, and Jim, all I ask you, you indicated that you had a high African American uh, population in Gary, Indiana, high rates of poverty, et cetera, et cetera. In the, in the COVID battle right now, how do you see um, local medical systems responding to, or counties, in fact, responding to the need to get um, public housing, people living in public housing, um, tested? We are involved, and I'll make this quick, um, on the west side of Los Angeles, um, what is effectively really real neglect on that issue for a series of affordable housing complexes um, in Santa Monica and on the west side, which is known to be very affluent, but in fact, it has a lot of affordable housing. And the, the rub comes when they tell people to go to one of the sites that are, that are, that are a few miles away from where folks live, when in fact, because of mobility challenges, particularly for low-income elderly seniors, it's hard to get them there. And we've asked for a team to go into buildings, you know, um, and and do tests. And so far, we haven't had any luck. Or Great points, Ernie. Is that is that a question for Jim, or you you can? Well, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to. I guess it's a two prong question. The first question is number one. I think. Well, yeah. Let me make it a question. Um, do you know what the program is in those in those neighborhoods um, where you're running? And um, do you know what the program is for for low income folks that need testing? I, right. I will tell you that I have not seen any program specifically engaged to um, uh, you know affordable or public housing facilities. Um, that you know, it's a great point you brought up, and I you know I was um, last week um, I didn't go in, but at a senior housing facility um, uh, in Gary, we were just delivering lunches, and we didn't go in, but we did talk to some of the people who were administrators there, um, and you know there. I didn't ask that specific question, but just, you know, in our conversation, you know, I, I did not, I don't think there was any plan for comprehensive testing um, in the facility or in other facilities that were run by the housing authority. Um, and I haven't read or seen anything about that at other housing authorities um, in the district. I mean, there's certainly, you know, there are testing facilities popping up, but none of, but they, you have to have a car, you know, I mean, to, to, to get to the vast majority of them. And obviously it brings up another issue we have in this area, which is, you know, a lack of public transportation. I mean, there's no comprehensive public transportation. It's a, it's a fairly dense district. Um, there's no comprehensive public transit system whatsoever in the district. Um, some of the individual cities have them, but nothing linking cities and even the city's ones are, are sparse for the most part. So, um, you know, that between those two issues, I, I, I think it's a big concern and I'm, I'm gonna dig more on it, Ernie, now that you raised it and I'm glad you did. Well, thank you. Thanks, Ernie. Thanks, Jim. Um, Mike Fox, you, you had a question or comment for Jim. Actually, great minds think alike. Uh, I, I was, <laughs> Ernie's, Ernie, Ernie's question covered like 75% of mine, so I'll let somebody else out. Okay. Well, we are kind of at the end of the time we have for the candidates. Uh, frankly, uh, Jim, uh, last thoughts. Uh, to close out your segment at this point, appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would just, you know, uh, uh, biased here, but underscore the importance of this race. You know, this is a, this is a race that um, I think has kind of flown under a lot of people's, you know, radar outside of Northwest Indiana, um, but this is a safe blue seat. Um, and we are, um, you know, up against several people, but primarily um, against a candidate who's getting a lot of outside conservative, uh, uh, you know, money coming in here in the last minute, uh, certainly not a supporter of Medicare for all, um, to say the least. Um, but because I think, you know, some, some people outside the district recognize that they can get a, 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 a very, very, you know, conservative uh, Democrat in a bluer seat. And we want to make sure certainly that that doesn't happen, but also, you know, that we've got uh, uh, somebody who's going to advocate for a bold progressive vision, you know, from this district, starting with Medicare for all. But of course, there's a host of other, you know, important issues there. Um, so it's something that I'm looking forward to fighting for in Congress. It's something that I know that we can get. I know that we can win this race. 
um, and have been grateful for, for PDA support thus far. But um, if anybody has time to help us make phone calls in the last 10 days, um, if anybody can, you know, can spare a little bit and go to our website, which is harper4forindiana.com, um, I would be incredibly grateful for that support as we um, work to finish strong here. Well, thank you, Jim. You're certainly on, on our radar now, so uh, really appreciate it. And, um, and thanks to all the candidates who joined us. I think uh, that's been one of the strong points for these emergency uh, healthcare emergency town halls that we've had is to bring up uh, local leaders and, uh, and really appreciate hearing your voice and the fact that you, you've jumped into these races. So um, having said that, let me bring up our PA leader, uh, Mike Fox, back on again. And he can give us the 411 on uh, actions we can take for this week. Mike Fox, floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Bell, um, and thanks to all of the speakers, our incredible candidates. You rock, you rock. So, uh, as always, we've got an ar of what an arm's length of stuff <laughs> to to be uh, to be getting involved in. So, number one, I would suggest. Um, if you are up for making any type of uh, telephone calls for any of the candidates that you have seen here, email me at mikefox at pdamerica.org and I will immediately get, the, get you uh, connected with what we're doing with our database. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we're pushing our people out to make sure that they're voting for these candidates. Uh, and once those are absolutely pummeled, then we, then we uh, push, uh, push on to the candidates' uh, phone banks themselves. So number one way to help, get on the phone and yank some votes for these people. Number two way to help, we are um, regularly engaged in educating Congress via the telephone and through a uh, campaign called the Educate Congress Letter Drop. Under most circumstances, that letter drop consists of you just simply swinging by your local congressional office with a letter with several pieces of legislation and simply asking them, hey, sign on to this. Well, with our social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, right now, it's a little bit more email, telephone call follow-up approach. But bottom line, if you want to be the liaison to your local congressperson on issues, not only on Medicare, but likewise our other extremely progressive issues, email me at mikefox at pdamerica.org and say, I want to be part of the Educate Congress letter drop campaign. Or if you want to pound a phone uh, to Congress, same deal. We have several bills that we're pushing right now, bills that support the nurses as uh, they need their protections, supporting Bernie's, uh, Bernie and Pramila Jayapal's uh, bill on um, funding the big hole right now, as uh, Dr. Cohen had brought up, the, the big hole for folks where they aren't going to be covered, where they're either underinsured, they have no insurance, whatever the case may be. Uh, Bernie and Pramila's bill um, address that issue. So if you're up for pounding a phone to Congress, hit me up. Likewise, uh, for those Bernie supporters out there, we're pushing out uh, Bernie vote as well in the upcoming primary states because one of the best ways for us to bring Medicare for all to the forefront is if we get Bernie 25% or more of those delegates. If that happens, then you're going to see either Dr. Bill or somebody like Dr. Bill and plenty of other folks on that platform committee saying, look, if you're not for Medicare for all, just call yourself a Republican. Republican. And so we want to be able to make big, big noise at the convention. That's why we're still pushing Bernie delegates out so we get to that 25%. And then the last one, if you don't have enough to do yet, and then the last campaign uh, is a local campaign focused on um, resolutions at the local government level. It can be a very powerful way to bring, to flip a uh, congressperson. If they know that a major city in their district has shown official support for Medicare for All, it's a good way to flip them. So any of the above, email me at mikefox at pdamerica.org and we will keep you busy, busy, busy. I would reinforce our, our candidates on this call have deadlines looming. So uh, we, of course, want to think of that 
first and foremost. And uh, we'll call that a wrap. Oh yeah, and lastly, money, money, money. Uh, we've, we've got some folks uh, who have donated today. Thank you so very much. Do what you can before you leave this call. And that is all Dr. Bill. Love y'all. Well, we love you, Mike Fox, and um, and thank goodness we have you there in St. Pete's, uh, Florida, but uh, or anywhere at all. So we appreciate it. Uh, like I said, the guy never sleeps, and when he says he will get you doing stuff immediately, he means it any time, day or night. So Mike Fox at PDAmerica.org. Um, let me just say we are a couple of minutes past the top of the hour. No one's really in a big hurry to leave. If folks have more questions or comments uh, afterwards, by all means, stick around. Our next meeting uh, should be coming up this Sunday, May 31st. We actually have to develop a whole new Zoom meeting room, so there will be a, likely a new link for this meeting next week, so watch for that um, and or contact Mike Fox um, for the new link. For our meeting, it will be the same time, same place, uh, except for the link. Uh, so it will be Sunday, May 31st, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. And um, and also, um, uh, just by way of an announcement, a couple of us have done a Zoom movie showing this last week. We showed Fix It over the Zoom format to a a, you know, good sized group, maybe a dozen people, but uh, be fun to push that out even further. So uh, our group is planning a follow up movie showing. We're going to show the healthcare movie, you know, narr narrated by the famous Canadian actor Kiefer Sutherland, which tells the story of his even more famous grandfather, Tommy Douglas, and how when we got Medicare for seniors in the 1960s, they got Medicare for all in Canada. With, uh, with a great discussion session to follow. So that's gonna be Saturday, May 30th. Uh, that will be posted in the PDA Facebook uh, page, uh, PDA Healthcare Facebook page. So watch for that too. So again, I, I'd like to thank all our presenters, their campaigns for helping us bring them forward in this venue. And once again, thanks to PDA staff for all your help. And, and thanks again uh, to all of you for joining us. Um, with that, any last questions, comments that folks have? Oh, I would just make a comment. Uh, it was great to see Michael Lighty drop in. I don't know if those of you might miss, have missed that Michael Lighty has been a board member for PDA and part of our uh, retreat group known as the Winslow Group for many years. Uh, and, uh, and just an absolute guru on the subject of Medicare for All. I personally would like to extend this public in invitation to Michael if you could join us next week. We do have an opening for a speaker. would love to have you speak maybe on your perspective on the strategy for getting Medicare for All into the 2020 platform of the DNC. So uh, we did have a, uh, um, a great discussion, a presentation from our good friend Russell Green, who spoke about how he worked to get the climate emergency language into the platform in, in 2016. And so we're looking to do similarly in, in 2020. So Michael, there's your, your invitation, not to put you on the spot, no pressure. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm happy to do it, uh, uh, Dr. Bill, and look forward to the discussion. I really enjoyed today's too, so thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. So, so great to, to hear you and have you with us, So uh, as always. Um, any other Last comments, questions from the group in general. Dr. Bill, Mike Fox, real quick. I just yeah. wanted to say, I just wanted to say, number one, uh, wonderful job on reeling Lighty in there. I'm looking forward to it. But <laughs> looking forward to hear my hearing Michael Lighty. Secondly, a special thank you. I, I wanted to get out here. Um, we had Sharzad. Sharzad, your good friend, uh, has donated to all three of our candidates during this uh, during this program. Thank you so much, Sharzad. We appreciate it. And I know you didn't need that shout out, but I just wanted to make sure that it got out there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if all could be like Sharzad, the world would be a better place. Thank you. I agree. 100%. 100, right? Like that emoji, 100. <laughs> I agree. Fabulous person. Well, this meeting room is filled with fabulous people, so thank you all. Um, any other last comments, questions? All right, not seeing any. 
Oh, did did Ann? Did I see Ann Jones? Did you have your hand up? Oh, or are you just waving by? <laughs> You're unmuted. Oh, you were. Let's see. Okay. No, just waving goodbye. This is the first time I've gotten to join this uh, group. I gave you my email address, and um, Dr. Bill, we met at the conference in Portland. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I'll uh, I'll I will hop on um, if I can uh, get on your list. Wonderful. Thank you so much. If folks did got to this uh, meeting by any way other than a, a direct email from PDA then you have to wonder if you're getting our emails. And the easiest thing to do is to go to pdamerica.org and rejoin. Just put in your, your updated information in the join window so we can make sure that you receive all announcements. If you go the extra step and click on healthcare, then you'll have every announcement specifically related to healthcare. And also feel free to message me, Dr. Bill, at pdamerica.org, just D-R-B-I-L-L. Um, if you'd like to get in our, what we fondly call our kitchen cabinet for uh, the healthcare team, so you can be involved in the planning for these meetings uh, going forward. So thank you for that. Anyone else? All right. So otherwise, I'm just going to wish you all um, to stay home and stay healthy, and we'll see you next time.